On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Nathan Fabian. He is the Managing Director and Head of Talent at WestCap. We're going to be talking about what makes a leader great. And obviously, we're talking about that in relation to hiring, finding those right attributes, assessing the attributes. You obviously want to move quickly, but also be thorough, which is obviously not always easy to do. Nathan, thanks for being on the show. I'm excited to cover this topic with you. Thanks, Amir. It's good to be here. Awesome. So if you could tell us a little bit about what WestCap does and the type of companies you guys invest in, that'd be great. Yeah. So WestCap was founded by Lawrence Tosi. Uh, uh, LT is a serial entrepreneur. He's founded multiple companies along that journey. He was also the CFO at Blackstone and Airbnb. We had a big impact on both of those organizations. And Westcap was founded with the vision that a group of experienced operators, along with giving capital to companies, can actually offer a lot more alongside that by providing operational experience as well. And so when you look at our team that we built today, we're 50% investment professionals, and 50% ex-operators. And these are people who have either founded companies themselves or held executive roles, whether it's in go-to-market strategy, in talent, in product, in financial excellence, the list goes on at the types of companies that we invest in. And so we all kind of work together, both the investment team, the operating team, to identify companies where we can not only you know provide capital to make an impact, but also provide operating experience. And then once we do make an investment, we lean in, you know, really hand in hand with these organizations to help them put in place the a really strong foundation for them to build on top of as they grow. And it's a really fun thing to be a part of. We typically invest in companies with around 20 to $50 million in revenue. We say our sweet spot is around Series C. Sometimes that flexes down to B or D, depending on the opportunity in the organization. And yeah, that's a little bit about Westcap. Awesome. All right. We appreciate that. And um, topic what makes a for a great leader you know i I think it's an interesting one because a lot of times when it comes to leadership hires it's a little bit different than when you're hiring for a hard skill or an aptitude of skills i think it's not not as straightforward i guess at the highest level right let's kind of define uh leadership and then maybe some of the attributes that you know you have seen make for a successful leader and then we'll dive on in so this is something that you know I've thought a lot about in my career, but also we at Westcap have spent a ton of time thinking about. And so at the stage, you know, when you think about traditional venture capital, a big part of the investment thesis is is this a visionary founder that is going to do things better, different than everyone else? When you think about traditional private equity, you think about is this a great business? And if we bring in the right team, can we make this business work? Westcap sits right in the middle of those two. We have to invest both in the business and in the CEO. So over the past few years, we spent a ton of time actually modeling out, just like we would a business, what are the attributes that we found to be most predictive of our CEOs being both successful, but also good partners for us to work with that we think we can add value to. And so we've we've set up a really interesting model. We actually have, we now have five archetypes of founders. So we use those archetypes to say, okay, based on this person's background, if they're a technologist, if they're a closer, if they are a, you know, an experienced executive, what do we expect them to be incredible at and where do we expect them to wobble? And then we spend a ton of time before we actually make an investment getting to know them and understanding, you know, based on the hypothesis that we have, based on the archetype that they are, where are their strengths? Where do they spike? And and what do we are we going to need to support them on? And so we look for five attributes that we've also kind of built out over time. And those things that we look at are number one, we look at principles. Um, you know, are they an ethical person? Do they have principles that have been formed through pressure over time? And do they have a genuine care for people, both employees, customers, and so on? The next thing we look for is curiosity. Are they a lifelong lear- learner? We look at their willingness to make decisions and their process for making decisions. Uh, we find that to be a big precursor to execution. So if you can't decide what you're going to do, there's no way you're going to execute on it. <laughs> so we, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about decisiveness. How do they manage a team um, is the next one. And then the final piece, and this is one, you know, that is not going to be a surprise to anyone, but do they have a vision? Are they, can they describe that vision? But I think the piece for us that's real different about vision is we look 
for people who have a pragmatic understanding of the industry that they're trying to provide value to. So have they been a customer? Have they actually worked in that industry before? Do they know the niche they're trying to fix? Or do they just have some exciting idea, but not a true understanding of of what they're actually building towards? So those are the things that we look for. And I think the important thing to point out is, A, that's not everything. There are a thousand more lists on what make a good leader. And, and I agree that there are aspects of all of them that are totally true. These are the things that we find to be most predictive of good partners for us. But I think the second piece is we don't expect any CEOs to be fantastic on all of these. And so then the next thing we look for is based on where they spike, what's the team that you need to build around them? And I think that's where the conversation gets really exciting because, you know, great leadership is actually kind of diversity of leadership across an executive team um, that makes for, uh, makes for, you know, a group of people that can really drive value to company. So, so definitely um, want to follow up on the five different attributes that you outlined. As you kind of see leadership across the various industries, companies, hires that that you guys have made. Is that balance of those five very intrinsic to every single role? Or is are there some attributes that just typically bubble up of those five that are are more determinate? It's a it's a great question. So when we when we started to kind of frame out this model, you know, a number of years ago, we thought we had to be looking across everything. And I think that our experience sense has shown us that a few are much more critical than others. And in our experience, in my experience, I have, I've really seen it come down to three things that, um, that just cannot be taught, um, that people need to almost carry as values in the way that they approach leadership. And, and, and in our attributes, those show up as number one curiosity. So, are they a lifelong learner? Are they intellectually curious? And are they humble enough to know that in order for their business to scale, they cannot always have all the answers and solve all the problems themselves? Number two is principles. So do they have strongly held principles that even under pressure, when it is easy to cut corners, they will follow what is ethical, what is the right thing to do? and do they have a genuine value for people, the people in their company, their customers, or do they just see them as revenue and opportunities? And we find there's a huge differentiation if they truly value the people that they're working with and working for. And then the last one is, it comes under team management, but can they attract and retain great people? And so we really, over time, have looked more and more, not just at the CEOs that we're investing in, but also at the team they've surrounded themselves with, their openness to hiring people that have more experience, that teach them, uh, and then building trust with those individuals. And we find those three things to be kind of the, you know, the baseline, the barrier for entry. Um, when you start talking about decisiveness, vision, um, some aspects of team management, a lot of CEOs, if they're curious enough, they can get good at those things over time. But the other ones we found are more, much more difficult. Absolutely. You know, as you're as you're describing uh, attributes of leaders, leaders, I, I am trying to, in my mind, go through processes that I've I've seen, been a part of, and it's one of the harder things to assess for those attributes. I think any any person in town would go it's much easier to stick some kind of a test in front of somebody and 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 see how they do uh for hard skills when it comes to some of these attributes what have you seen in terms of assessing and and the reason i'm asking that is typically people who have uh some of these attributes uh can also represent them as strengths but they're just part of their personality and they're really not delivering on the core of those values. And it's not easy to see. I mean, heck, forget hiring a leader. Sometimes somebody you meet, you're like, well, I think this this person's this way. And then you get to know them and you go, well, that was a lot more banter and talk than delivery. How do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, well, we we have all for those of us who have who have hired people, and you know, and I know in, in the talent world, many of us have have. We've all hired that person. We walked out in the interview and said, "This is the most amazing candidate I've ever seen." You bring him into the company. <laughs> Six months later, you're t- you're saying a very different story and saying, "How did I miss that? Right? How did I miss that?" Because people are people are good at interview interviewing, and visionary entrepreneurs are fantastic telling stories and what you want to hear. And so this is something that we've talked a lot about too. And the first question I get is, 
do you use any psychometric testing in your diligence process as you're getting to know CEOs, you're getting to know leadership teams? In my experience, psychometric testing is a fantastic tool for development. But when you're trying to use it to identify the right leader for a ver- for an earlier stage company, it is just another data point and is not super predictive of how successful they're going to be because you don't exactly know the psyche of that leadership team over time. So we do not use psychometric testing until we've already made the investment more as a development tool for our leaders rather than as an assessment tool. What we found to be much more effective is, first of all, just having a calibrated model of attributes that we look for in the first place, that we're all speaking the same language and looking for the same examples is a gigantic step forward. And then from there, what we do is, you know, we see across the time that we're assessing a leadership team, we could have anywhere from 20 to 30 people at WestCap meeting with these leaders. And it could be everyone from an administrative assistant to our managing partner, to someone from the investment team, to someone from our strategy and operations teams, and all under very different circumstances. We actually train up everybody at the firm. We are all assessors of talent, of leadership. And then we bring all of those conversations together in a calibrated method and say, okay, well, this was my experience on their curiosity when I gave them a suggestion or we had a conversation about this. Well, actually, you know, for the more junior investment partner, they dismissed me when I gave them a suggestion. So I I felt like the curiosity was not at the same level that your experience was. And we debate that stuff really thoroughly as a team. And, you know, with enough data points of observation over time, um, we found it to be pretty predictive of how we can partner with them uh, in the future. So it's really, it is capturing multiple experiences in a framework that we have all been trained up on and then coming back to them time and time again and having a conversation um, that has been the best way for us to to really get a handle on the reality of the situation. I quite like that because I, I, I do believe that different viewpoints when it comes to, you know, I, I don't want to call them subjective attributes. But it's really hard to sometimes come up with an objective way to evaluate some of these different principles, especially in leaders. I I do like the viewpoints. The process itself, as you guys have maybe been watching, you guys have been taking the notes of data and whatnot. Obviously, sometimes if you're going to have a candidate talk to multiple people, have to go through multiple steps, that does add length to time of interview, but also increases thoroughness. Good, fast, cheap, as they always say can't get all three. You got to pick. And and in this case, you know, a lot of times you probably have scenarios where you guys need to move quickly, but sounds like you got a pretty darn good process. How does that balance? Obviously you want to move quick. You don't want to move too quickly. You want to be thorough. You don't want to slow down the process. So in my opinion, moving too slow on a hire is one of the most dangerous things that you can do when you're building a team. Right. I have talked to a lot of executives making hires and very few, if any, have ever said to me, oh, man, I really should have moved slower on that hire. (laughs) The majority say, wow, I should have brought this person in six to 12 months earlier. And I think, fortunately, for people building companies, whether you have an internal recruiting team or you don't, there are there are really great executive recruiters or recruiting firms out there that can help you move fast on this stuff. You know, we actually have one portfolio company called Hunt Club that's doing some really interesting things, um, both across mapping networks, but they've also mobilized a community and nurtured this community of experts. They have 25,000 different experts now around the country that they work with to facilitate warm intros to people who may be a fit for the type of role that you're hiring for. So there's a lot of interesting stuff happening out there to source candidates quickly. But what uh, what recruiters and what recruiting firms cannot do for hiring managers and where I see most processes actually slow down is the hiring manager taking ownership over finding the right person. Now, the CEOs that I work with, I will typically tell them that from the time we start this search, for the next six months, you're going to need to dedicate 10 to 20% of your time 
to making sure that you find the right person and that they're set up for success. And that's for everything from role definition to building a relationship through the interview process to their onboarding. And it takes a ton of time. And I think that a lot of hiring managers don't recognize this. And so if you can find the right balance of having a great recruiting partner that you're going to work with that will bring you highly qualified candidates with vetted experience and their ability to execute. And if you're not getting that from your recruitment partner, you should uh, you should demand better or find a new one. But then it's also just making sure that you are truly committed to dedicating the time that it takes and taking ownership over the process uh, to get the right person in on board and set up for success. Maybe to come back, you, you mentioned something I want to touch, you, have you touch on. Obviously, when you guys are hiring um, a leader, you mentioned the company they're going into and building out their leadership team or, or working with existing leaders. As you're kind of going through and, and, and looking at some of the attributes you outlined, you have, you have a di- new, I guess, a different dynamic of also <clears throat> projecting how this person will interact with then other multiple personalities. So obviously the problem is now being multiplied and magnified multiple fold. When you guys are going through that process, how do you guys start weighing the leader in the potential hire? Because obviously you want them to fit with the team. You might need some of the traditional storming, norming, conforming as well. So you have to maybe think about that. But how do you start balancing, you know, that fit? So. I mean, I think you could never underestimate the importance of culture. You need to understand the team, the way the team works together, and and the way the company operates. Um, and you need to understand if the hire that you're making will fit into that just as much as if their experience is exciting to you. Absolutely critical. I mean, I think ego is really important to keep in check. You know, humility is a big thing we look for when we're meeting with executives, especially in the hyper growth space, because we're looking for people who can take a company public, but are also willing to roll up their sleeves and manage a three person team for the next two years until, until they get to that point. So that's a, it's a very special, you know, it's a very special type of leader. But then I think the last aspect that we just don't talk about enough is the importance of keeping in perspective that a lot of the executives that are being hired, Series C, Series B, CEOs are probably hiring. It's the most senior person that they have ever hired onto their team. They don't have experience onboarding that type of person. They don't have experience managing that type of person. And so one of the things we spend a lot of time with our teams on is onboarding. You know, what what is the three, six, 12-month plan to set this executive up for success. And we find that that is a, almost as important as the interview process itself in order in order to helping our CEOs effectively build the relationship, set clear expectations, and get and, and get the trust in place to get that group off to a strong start. The other thing that we do along lines of onboarding is we will spend multiple days facilitating offsites for executive teams that are forming, norming, storming uh, before they're performing to help them accelerate that process. So I'll personally do it, sit in the room. We've done it with over half of our portfolio companies and spend multiple days just getting them to the point where they can have debate, they can align on decisions, they can set clear priorities and then go and communicate that back to their teams. Um, And we find that to be really high impact way to follow on a great hire. I was going to ask you this question. I don't think I uh, mentioned it, but I think it fits within the context of of hiring for a great leader. Growth teams, I guess there are times when you should be focused on hiring for the now and obviously for the maybe near future, long-term future. That's tricky because obviously you don't want to hire somebody that's perfect now and then 18 months from now, they hit a limitation or capacity of ability. So how do you approach that? It, it, you know, obviously you always have to hire for the skills you need, but obviously, you know, on the flip side, you love somebody to grow into a role and that's a balancing act, the the hire for the now or the future potential. I, I think it's another question of you have to look across the full picture of the team And I think that you get a couple of shots that are folks who are super hungry, are excited to grow into that role and going to roll up their sleeves and make the impact. And I think those people are really important um, for any startup organization because they bring fresh ideas, they bring a lot of energy, so they set the pace. 
But I also think that you need folks who have seen scale before and they know what good looks like, not necessarily to replicate that, but to make sure that you have a bar that you're building towards that will maintain a scalable organization. And so when we look across an executive team, we say, okay, so what are the roles in this team that need to be truly innovative and do things differently based on the company you're trying to build? And what are the roles in this team that we just need to bring in some expertise because we because the way that it has been done in the past with with a little bit of with a little bit of change is going to work really well for us and will set us up for success in the future. And a lot of times these are in the finance, you know, the finance functions are a great place to bring in someone with a lot of experience. You know, your revenue functions are when you're building out a go-to-market strategy is a great place to bring in someone with a lot of experience. But it um, you know, it's different for every team, especially depending on where your CEO spikes. You know, uh, depending on what they're great at, um, that's 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 what we used to think about that balance. I think I think it's fair. Um, I think it's it's really interesting because I'm I'm listening and I think um, a lot of times I'm I'm hearing you mention um, where somebody spikes and and being able to observe somebody's strengths is key when it comes to leader. Again, maybe 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 slightly off topic, but I, I am curious since you see leaders. A lot is made up of always trying to work on your weaknesses. I actually personally think the opposite. I think, you know what? Work on your deficiencies, you should. But doubling down on your strengths might be really what gives you the most return. How, how do you perceive that? Is it, is it a case of looking for somebody that comes in potentially and is super strong given a couple of weaknesses and you go outweighs? Is it a circumstance by circumstance situation? How do you kind of view that? We should all be working on our weaknesses all the time, right? Like we all, we should all be looking for ways to improve, to be learning new things. I think that we should make sure that our highest impact people at organizations are spending the majority of their time deploying the skills and the things that they are absolutely the best at. Our engineers, our strongest coders, we should be interrupting them as infrequently as possible so they can be writing fantastic code for the organization. If we have a CEO that can bring any customer to the table and our product is already pretty fully developed, they should be out in the field, you know, 70% of the time talking to customers and bringing those people to the table. And so I think that, you know, a high functioning team is about balancing out people's weaknesses with other people's spikes. But that's not to say that we all shouldn't be working on our weaknesses all the time as well. I just don't think that we should be leaning on it as the primary, as the primary way that we're adding value to the business. Nathan, I, I love it. I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you for taking the time to share with us. I, I'm sure we did not exhaust the topic. We've got we've got plenty of uh, areas left to cover, but obviously you got to get back to your day job. And um, if somebody does want to reach out to you to to pick your brain on anything you mentioned, what is a good way of connecting with you? I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I keep an eye on it. So please reach out. We'd love to connect. Okay. Awesome. We'll make sure to include um, your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Again, thanks for being on. Thanks for taking the time with us. It's a pleasure, Amir. Take care. Absolutely. That's it for the show. We'll be back again. Different guests, different topic. Until then, two things. One, I think Ethan did a fantastic job outlining some of those attributes of leadership's hires and what people should be looking for. So please share this with somebody else that's going to hopefully make use of it. I think we're going to find a lot of uh, good examples that we can draw from. And uh, also like, subscribe, comment, let me know how the podcast is going for y'all. Until next time, thank you and goodbye.